2018, MLS was named by Responsa Ball as the most environmentally sustainable soccer league in the world. From platinum certified environmentally sustainable stadiums to supporter led days of service to these Adidas Parlay kits worn by every team on Earth Day, made from plastic waste found on our beaches and shorelines across the country and put into kits, a symbol to respect and protect the oceans. It isn't even so much the fact that recycling is important in terms of the use of materials, it's also just a change in the way that you look at the world and in our stewardship of the natural world. We all enjoy the outdoors here in the Pacific Northwest, and we want to keep it like this. We don't want it to go to waste. My love for the environment came as a function of family, where my uncle, who used to work for Greenpeace, would take me out on his research vessels, or my mom, a professor of environmental policy, used to bring me here to Whale Point on the San Juan Islands, just off the Puget Sound, for weeks on end to camp, before I even dreamed of playing professional soccer. So it feels right to come back now and see how the Sounders and soccer are actually inspiring the next generation of kids to fall in love with their environment and protect the future of Puget Sound. In Seattle, the Sounders have made the unprecedented move of going carbon neutral in 2019 and beyond, calculating everything from team travel, fan travel, and everything that happens here on game days at the link. A lot of stadiums done LED lighting. They've reduced water usage through automatic sensors and faucets and that kind of stuff. And they've even put solar panels on the west-facing part of CenturyLink Field to provide renewable energy. 94 to 96% of all waste either is recycled or composted, so very little bit of it goes to landfills. Hey, you have really an opportunity here for leadership, not only in MLS, but in all of North America and with all five major sports leagues. The name Seattle Sounders, founded in 1974, was almost left a thing of the past. Thinking of renaming before they moved to MLS, the supporters started a grassroots effort to keep the original Sounders name. A decade later, the Sounders boast a Supporter Shield, four U.S. Open Cups, and the 2016 MLS Cup. The Seattle Sounders have done it! MLS Cup winners in 2016! MLS Cups, record on the field, that's our main focus, that's our main business, but why can't we lead in different areas? I saw all these photos going through your offices of the old Sounders teams, yourself included, in the short shorts and in the forest, <laughs> kind of like this, yeah. for the team I picture. I remember that photo. <laughs> it's all part of the culture here. People in this area are pretty environmentally conscious. I would say Seattle is one of the leaders in our country about trying to be good to our planet. It's all we have. You hear a lot of talk about businesses and their sustainability values sure. and projects they do, right. but how do you tell the difference between a place that's really going in it for the right reasons sure. and then this other term that you hear, greenwashing? Sure. As we look into Earth Month or Earth Day even, there will be ads on TV, there'll be social media campaigns of companies trying to tout their green credentials just so they can look good. You have to not only look at what they're saying and what they claim on their website, but what are they doing? The colors, sounder blue of the Puget Sound, rave green for the forest, and cascade shale of the mountain range surrounding downtown, connect the club to the environment in which it lives. It is also reflective of the environmental awakening of the time in which it began, where on March 21st, 1970, four years before the Sounders' first match, the world's first Earth Day was held in Seattle and across the US, with an estimated 20 million Americans taken to the streets. Three years later came the Endangered Species Act of 1973, putting the conservation of endangered plants, animals, and habitats into federal law. Today, it protects the southern resident killer whale, a symbol of the Sounders past just recently brought back. We have another friend of the environment here today. He has been away in the Puget Sound for a very long time. He's back to the Seattle coastline, and he loved to teach kids about the earth and the environment. We're talking about Sammy the Sounder. The southern resident killer whales are the only population in the U.S. that are listed on the endangered species list. 
These are a small population of killer whales that only eat fish. They don't eat marine mammals. And so as the fish have declined, primarily Chinook salmon, so have the whales. The southern resident orcas, an icon in the Puget Sound. The fish-eating killer whales that have called these waters home for tens of thousands of years. Now, they're at a breaking point. They're spread out looking for food far more than they find it, and they know their babies are dying. Tahlequah certainly did. She carried her dead calf on her head for 17 days and 1,000 miles. These resident orcas with tight family bonds and deep emotional intelligence, a population down to 75 whales, when it's believed historically more than 200 swim these waters. It was just a parade of mourning. A lot of people don't like to believe that animals have emotions, but I think it was relatable. A lot of people just saw how sad it was because they know that they'd be doing that if they lost their child. Are killer whales social, emotional yes. creatures? I'd like to believe so. Of course, there isn't scientific proof, but I, I would like to believe so. The area of the brain related to their emotions that's more developed than in humans, so it shows that they had empathy, so it shows that they probably do have feelings if that area is more evolved, right? So, The Duwamish River, named after the indigenous Duwamish tribe, runs straight through the heart of the Sounder Starfire Training Complex. Killer whale overall represents the Duwamish people as they were a sea-oriented people. The tail ovid represents the white man when he first came to Puget Sound, and the eye ovid represents the Duwamish natives. For centuries, this river has been the breeding ground for indigenous salmon as they make their way up the river. But due to industrialization and pollution, in 2001, the EPA named this a Superfund site, meaning it's one of the most toxic and hazardous waste sites in the nation. The Duwamish is heavily industrialized. It's a four mile stretch that basically post-World War II, you had all these other manufacturers just dumping leads and contaminants. Down on the bottom of the water, that sediment is like super toxic. I say Duwamish, you say river, Duwamish. Yeah. Duwamish. Yeah. Thank you very much. This was a really polluted area before, and you guys have taken it upon yourselves as a club to clean it up. How is that, uh, and why is that? I think it's just part of the overall goal of the club. If we can do good things, lead by example, and bring a couple people on board each time we go out, pretty soon you gather us all up together and we become a stronger voice. So I think, again, that's just part of being environmentally correct. I was at an appearance where we planted 350 trees. When we planted all those trees, that stream was at one point a salmon spawning stream, and they want to get it back. Hopefully that gives the orcas a better chance to survive. Remember what she said about the roots? So I want to spread them out a little bit. Many athletes in many different sports use their voice to do a lot of great things for underprivileged kids, for the communities, for soccer. Soccer players are role models. Students look up to them. When they take the lead in some initiatives, it's really important because you know that they're going to have more impact. There's a long history of residential and school segregation in Seattle. Some people don't like hearing that, but it's a fact. In the south end of Seattle, there are a lot of kids who love the game but don't have access to it. You know, South Seattle is sort of like often overlooked part of the city. And often when I sit on the light rail and the train goes through all these different areas and only after it goes through the tunnel and you can see downtown, you hear people say, oh, that's Seattle, as if all this other part of 30, 40 minutes on the right rail was something else. The Barbado, it'll still fall for Yedlin, saved by Eric, that's a Yedlin! We're very proud of our own DeAndre Yedlin. 
So hopefully one day someone like Nathaniel, um, who is also from South Seattle, just like Deandre, could make us as proud. Hopefully it gives kids hope, not false hope though. Not everybody's gonna be pro and that's okay, but having that discipline and that drive and that focus, yeah, it's fantastic. I saw on the edge of the classroom the photos with the different colors and the dividing lines of yeah. these different emotional realms. Very often students don't achieve their full potential because of the lack of socio-emotional support. We can often have conflicting emotions happening at the same time and just being able to understand what you're feeling at any given moment is a good starting point and also being able to verbalize how you're feeling so that people around you understand where you're coming from. So is Sammy being silly or does he feel sad? You tell me. And what should Sammy do with that feeling of being sad? Should he A, hide or B, tell a friend? A or B? Good job. The assembly was about sustainability, but we tied in reflection with the reflection garden and talked a little bit about feelings and that all feelings are okay. And Harry Ship joined us to talk about his feelings. Do you still get nervous before a match, Harry? I do, I get nervous every game. Um, do any of you guys get nervous before tests or presentations, anything? Still? Yeah, that's the same feeling I have before every game now still. A lot of the kids hadn't been to a game before Sounders sent them. So we targeted this district specifically because it's got a high population of free and reduced lunch students. So that means they live below the poverty line and that's where we want to invest. I'm not trying to teach my students what to think, but I'm trying to teach them to just think for themselves, showing them what else is out there because sometimes if you live in poverty, the world seems much smaller. We're trying to break the pattern here in South Seattle and really give them that voice and understanding that they really matter and that we kind of count on them to change things. One, two, three, right? All right, let's get our thing. Hey. When you're as old as I am, it's hard sometimes to change people. We're already grown into who we are. The best chance we have, in my opinion, to drive change is to start with kids. Start them when they're young. It's the same like reading a book or doing math or something like that. If you teach them playing to be- Playing soccer. Yeah, playing soccer. It's a great, great example. You teach them at an early age, it stays with them throughout their lives. Kids aren't faking it. We all get older, we kind of learn to fake it, right? And kids don't. They have very raw, unfiltered perceptions about the world, which is why that the sense of justice of little kids, for example, tends to be, you know, very sort of keen. They don't layer it with all kinds of rationalizations the way that adults do. London came to me a couple of years ago. She was interested in whales, and it took me about, oh, 3.5 seconds to recognize that this kid was just extraordinary. But she did go through a period a few months ago where she was quite upset because it had gotten back to her that somebody was saying that, oh, she's being used by people and she's being manipulated. And she was very upset by that. And I called her and I said, congratulations, you've just, uh, you know, you've just upset somebody in power. And that's a fantastic thing. And, you know, and if, if you're not upsetting somebody in power, you're not doing your job in this business. And, you know, congratulations. And so she went from being depressed to actually feeling quite pleased with herself, which is great. We were talking before about Megan Rapino, the oh, yeah. uh, Seattle Reign and women's national team player, and a little bit about her story too, about kind of speaking up even when other people might say, you know, hey, I disagree with you. How do you deal with moments when maybe somebody says they see it different than you do? No matter what you do, there's always somebody who's not gonna like what you're doing, which you just have to accept that. Yeah. Well, I would say there's a lot more people that are uh, proud of you, inspired by you. And I think you've caught the attention of a couple people in particular. So I wanted to play this video for you. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Hey, you little world changer. Um, I just want to tell you, I've been hearing about what you're doing, watch your video, it's so incredible. Keep fighting. Don't listen to what anybody says. You're saving those orcas, you're saving those whales. It's so amazing. Um, I'm so proud of you. Keep going. <laughs>
pretty cool, right? Yeah. I just think that that's just so cool because what I'm, what I'm doing, of course it's good, but I don't know why it's like that inspiring for people. So it's really cool to see when people are really inspired by me. When they listed our orcas as endangered, under the Endangered Species Act, they made a promise. A promise to protect them. A promise to preserve their habitat and a promise that future generations, such as my own, will be able to look out over the water and have a chance to see these national treasures in their own habitat, swimming freely without fear of starving to death. This future is beginning to fade if action is not taken now. We are the future and we will not stand idly by as some of our leaders scratch the backs of those who would tear down this world and watch the ecosystem collapse to make a dollar. The entire world is watching. Do the right thing. Thank you. Amidst the silent testimony of nature, kids in Seattle and across the globe are speaking truth to power, stepping into the void bravely and bringing with them the irrefutable wisdom of youth. While sport and sustainability may traditionally have been at odds, green fields surrounded by steel structures of stadiums, the Sounders are giving kids the tool sets to look at it differently and see how the two might actually come together. Inspired by their imagination, unafraid to both fear, feel, and fight for what's in front of them in their environment, these kids are determined to hold us to our promise, a simple one, to keep this place eternal blue, forever green.